welcome back. Here we are in the last lecture of this week, the l next to last week before the end of this um, monumental semester. Um, here we go. So power series, that's our topic for the day, and this should be the only uh, lecture on this topic. Um, and so let's just dive right in, okay? So here we go. Section 11.8, that's where we are now. Um, what are power series? Well, what are series? We are summing infinitely many things, right? And if we are summing, if we are doing power series, then what are we summing? Infinitely many power functions, okay? So let's um, remember what's a power function, okay? So a power function is a variable to a constant power, yeah? Okay, um, so a variable x to a fixed number power. All right, and, um, and then that's the simplest possible way we can think about a power function. We can multiply that times a constant. So we could say, okay, we have a constant times a power function, yeah? And then we could say, okay, well, let's add up infinitely many of these as, you know, for each possible value of n, a natural number um, or zero. Yeah? Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so um, the simplest um, version, there is, as you should have come to expect by now, lots of versions, right? The simplest version of a power series is if we are basically, so let's just write it out as a big sum first instead of using the summation notation, right? So suppose um, we have some, we need a little bit of extra space this way, okay? Um, suppose we have some function x to the power 1, right? Okay? And then we want to multiply that by some constant, right? So maybe like c1, because that kind of goes with the power, the subscript of c, the constant, goes with the power of 1. So that's a linear term, right? And then we add a quadratic term, so we have a constant, c2, times x squared, right? Okay? Plus, you tell me what's next. You guys are awesome. c3x cubed. One more, just to make sure we got this good. c4x to the fourth. So each one of these guys is a power function, right? A variable to a fixed power. Yeah? We're going to add all those guys up. Now, we don't want to um, leave off kind of the x to the 0 guy, right? That's just 1, right? Okay. Um, and so we also want to have a constant that can multiply that guy. So what do you think we'll call that constant? Just multiplying x to the 0, really, which is just 1. So good. C0. Very nice. Okay. So the constant term, right? Here's your mx plus b, the linear portion, right? And then everything else is adding some additional power of x, right? So sum all of these things up, right? Well, we've got a better way of writing that because that's a lot of stuff to write out, right? It took almost the whole whiteboard, right? We don't want to do that. We want to have a nice, succinct way of writing that. So we have our awesome summation notation. And so now, what am I going to be summing? Well, what is the basic form of each of my a n's, right? It says c sub n times an x to the n, right? c sub n times the x to the n. So c, uh, so what do I have? c sub n x to the n. That's what I'm summing. Where am I starting to count here now when n equals? Good, then 0. And then I go how long? forever. Yeah? Okay. Now, these c sub i's, the c sub i's, these are the subscripts, are constants. Right? That's what we were saying, multiplying power by a constant. Um, we also call these um, coefficients. It's another c word, right? So that's not too hard to remember. Coefficients. C word. So if I say what's the coefficient of x to the fourth, that's the C4 term, right? Okay, that will be important later as well. Okay, so we've got 
got this nice summation, and this is just a shorter way to write it. Are we all good here? X is a variable, right? Okay, X is some real number, any real number. Okay, um, let's see. So before we continue, right, let's remember what we had been doing. This is what we're gonna be doing now, right? This is the simplest version of a power series, right? Simplest power series. Um, what had we been doing, recall, we've essentially been by, you know, what sections, 11.2 through 11.6, right? That's what we've been working on. Um, what have we been doing? We've been uh, looking at Some, uh, it doesn't really matter where we start, we'll just say one. We could have started at zero as well. Of what? Just the constants, right? Yeah, that's really what we've been doing. So we've just, just been doing like C1 plus C2, we've just been calling it A, right? A1 plus A2 plus A3, right? Okay, so we've been adding up constants and trying to decide when does the sum of these infinitely many constants converge or diverge, right? Okay? And when we can say what it converges to if we actually really can sum it. So now we're up in the ante here, right? We're multiplying all these constants by functions, power functions, and we're kind of going to ask the exact same question. When does this sum converge or diverge, but we really like maybe need a little bit more new lingo, right? That, that kind of, you know, raises it up a level to be uh, on the same level of power as this guy is, right? Yeah? Okay, so um, let's also look at what's a generalization of the power series that we're going to look at um, more generally. erase this now because it's in my way yeah okay so just thinking about comparing what we have been doing to what we're doing now more generally um, we uh, often consider power series um, in powers of, instead of just in powers of x, oftentimes in powers of x minus a, okay? So what would that look like? Well, that would be a sum, n equals zero to infinity, of zn x minus a to the n, right? Just like it says, right? In powers of x minus a, instead of in powers of x, right? What's a up here? We'll write it down in just a sec. Hopefully you can, you can figure it out. So what would this be if we wrote it out? When n is 0, we would have c0. When n is 1, c1 times x, the quantity x minus a. Whoops. No, well, that was a times. Whoops, it looks like a dot. Okay. c2 times the quantity x minus a squared, right? Yeah. Plus c3 times the quantity x minus a cubed, where a is just some number, right? Some fixed constant number. Okay, yeah, are we good? All right, so now um, if you look at these two guys, they're really sort of the same thing, right? We could, we could expand this out, right, FOIL, right? And then we could reorganize and there would be a C2 times X squared term. And then you would have some other stuff, right, times a linear term in X, so that would get absolved over into here, right? And that would be like kind of what this guy would be. And then you would have some constant stuff and then you could stick that all into here, right? But sometimes it's not so useful to, um, to you know, expand these things out, certainly, when they get um, bigger powers. And it's really nice to be able to look at something in terms of x minus a, because what's a number that's super easy to plug in to this um, series? If I plug in x equals a, then this whole side is super easy to evaluate, right? If x is a, what is this side? Just c naught, right? Okay, so we kind of like that. So it's not always that we want to do it this way. Sometimes this way is more convenient, okay? 
So tell me, this power series, the simplest version of the power series, is um, we all we all we can also call this. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we say that this guy is a, a power series, right? That is centered at x equals a. We'll see precisely why that we really use that notation in just a little bit. We kind of talked about the whole idea of you plug in A, that's easy um, to evaluate, helps there. So this is a power series centered at x equals A. So we are, what is this guy, right? This simplest version. This guy is a power series centered where? At, you guys tell me? Good. What is A up here? A is zero. X to the N is the same as X minus zero to the N, right? Okay. If we plug in zero over here for X, what do we get? C naught. Very nice. So um, this is a power series centered at x equals zero, right? Okay, so that's the simpler one. But we can generalize that to uh, something else. Yeah? Okay. All righty. So what is now our question, right? The question becomes, when we're summing infinitely many power functions, Um, when does a power series converge or diverge? So that's different, right? It's different than the question that we've been asking. There's one extra word here, right? What did we used to ask? Does the series converge or diverge, right? That's what we were asking 11.2 to 11.6. Does the series converge or diverge? Now we're asking when does the series converge or diverge, right? That's a big deal, a big deal difference, right? What does this mean, this when? For what x values, right? Were you there with me? That's the difference, right? Suppose we put in 3 for x, right? Then this is just a sum of numbers, right? Does this converge when x is 3, right? Well, what if we put in negative 7 fourths for x? Then this is a sum of numbers. Does this converge when x is negative 7 fourths? That's our question, right? Does that make sense? Are we good? Um, okay. And what hopefully maybe you might be thinking is, well, it might depend on what these coefficients are. Okay. Anyway, um, so for what values, for what x values, um, does uh, a power series converge? That's what we're really asking, for what x values, right? Well, if we're asking for what x values, does the power series converge, well, what does it mean for a series to converge, right? Well, if a series converges, that means it sums to a single finite number, right? So the output of the sum, right, the output of that sum, is a single finite real number. You may not be able to find it, but that's the idea. You. So what are we asking here? Let's see if you can come up with the word that I'm really uh, wanting you to say. What x's can I put in such that what I get out is a single finite real number? What math word is that? We're really asking, what is the domain? There you are. What is the domain of this nutty new function? It's a nutty new function, yeah? What, what is the domain of the power series? That's really what we're asking. What numbers can you put in for x that you're going to get out something that isn't, does not exist, right? Okay, so um, we actually come up with new, more impressive sounding words than domain. So that's coming up right here in just a sec. But it's important to keep in mind what's really happening and not just get to like so engrossed in all of the notation and symbols that you kind of forget what you're really doing. Okay? All right. Are we ready to keep going? We got this idea, you know? And so you might even be thinking, like, oh my gosh, if it has a domain, right, then you might be able to talk about, wait a minute, 
if it's a function, can you take derivatives of it? Can you integrate it? Oh, right, okay, well, sadly this semester's probably gonna end before we can talk about that. But that's where it goes, so keep taking more math. Anyway, um, keep going. Let's see, don't get too off track. Um, all right, so let's talk about what are the possibilities, right? So that's where we are, what are the possibilities? Um, We're going to leave this guy up here, our power series, um, you know, powers of x minus a. We're just going to kind of leave that guy there so we see it. Now we're going to talk about the possibilities of this question. Um, there's really only three possibility possi possibilities there we go that's kind of nice okay it's only three possibilities that's not so bad okay so um let's write down these possibilities first and then we're going to talk about some things that they mean okay um first one possibility is that the um, three possibilities for the sum, right? n equals zero to infinity, c n, x minus a to the n. Okay? One possibility is that it converges only at x equals a. We just said plug x equals a in, you get nothing else but c zero, right? That's a finite number, it's a constant. So, but that might be the only place it converges. Put any number other than a in, it diverges, okay? So that's one possibility. It converges only at one number, right? A, wherever it's centered about. Um, the other possibility is that it converges for all x. Real. Woohoo! You've seen one of those already. Where? Okay. Um, that's kind of awesome, right? Domain is all real numbers. Yeah, this one domain is one number. Okay, that's it. Not much of a domain, right? And the third possibility, ooh, this one gets a little more crazy, um, is that it converges for, um, well, let's see, how are we going to say this? It converges for the distance between x and a, how far you, how far away you are from where the guy is centered at, right? It converges as long as you're not too far away, smaller than some number r. Nope, that r is different than that r, right? That's all real numbers. This is some real number r. Just trying to use the same notation in your book, right? It converges if you're here, okay? Um, and it diverges if that distance is bigger than r, okay? For this one, we diverges for x is not equal to a, right? Everything else, okay? Um, but then there's two more things left, right? Yeah, okay? Um, and what are those two things, right? Well, it's when we have the absolute value of x minus a equal to r. It's really just one, one thing but two things, right? Hopefully we'll see that just a little, in just a minute. Um, uh, we must investigate further to make any conclusions
going to get some, try to get a little more familiar with all of this and what it really means. Okay. All right. So let's think about um, our real number line. Right. So here's our real number line for it. Right. Here's the number a that our power series is expanded about. Okay. So what are we saying here? We're saying that either the series converges only at A, only if you're right there, if you're not at A, converges everywhere else. Converges for all real numbers, or it converges for, okay, now what does this say, right? The distance, right, between X and A is less than R, right? So I can go at most R units away from A, and if I move R units away from A, where am I? Where, if this is R and that's A, then this is good. A plus R, right? Yay. And I can use move R units away from A the other direction as well, right? And that will give me, yeah, A minus R. Yeah, right? Are we good? Um, and what am I saying, right? Here we're saying, okay, well, we know then that from here to here, we have convergence, okay? Um, what do we have if we're bigger, right? If my distance is bigger, then I have divergence. And if I'm right there at R units away from A, my two spots, right, that correspond to this case, then we don't know. We're here. Further investigation required. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So we introduced some terminology, okay? We introduced some terminology here. So um, we talk about the... Continue my little table here. I'm gonna make this a table. Okay. We talk about the this guy R. How far you can roam away from A is called the radius of convergence. Capital R is called the radius of convergence, okay, radius of convergence, um, and that is how far away from A you can roam, to the left, to the right, since we're only in Calc 1, right, Calc 3, it's crazier, okay, anyway, um, so, um, one dimensional calc. We're in Cal 2, but it's one dimensional calc. Anyway, um, so that R, we call this the ROC for short, radius of convergence, right? Okay, radius of convergence. So what is the radius of convergence in each of these three cases? If the series converges only at x equals a, then how far away from a can you roam? Nowhere, right? So what's the radius of convergence? Zero. Good. Um, if the series converges for all x, then how far away from a can you roam? As far as you want. No bounds, right? What does that mean? That's what we mean when we say the radius of convergence is infinite. You can go as far as you want, right? Both directions. All right. Um, and third, then, what would the you know what is the radius of convergence if we're in this? seemingly more complicated case, right? Seems like there's more work to do when you're in this case, right? Um, the radius of convergence is this guy R, how far away you can roam, right? So knowing the radius of convergence tells you a lot, right? Okay, and also this concept is saying, right, if I know the radius of convergence, right, then I know I can go that far away from me on one side and I can go that far away from me on the other side, right? Does that make sense, okay? 
So one of the questions in your homework says, can there ever be, a, um, could, a, could a power series ever converge for x positive? So from zero to infinity, but not for x negative. What do you think? Think about that. Would that be possible? Would there ever, would that fit in any of these three possibilities for radii of convergence? Hmm. Anyway, um, think about that. So here's our one concept, but the radius of convergence doesn't tell us everything, right? It does tell us that we know we have convergence from A minus R to A plus R not inclusive, right? But we don't know what happens here at the two endpoints, right? We, this endpoint could converge or diverge, and if X is at this endpoint, X, uh, we could have convergence or divergence. We don't know, okay? And so while this tells us we can go out that far, we still don't know what happens at the two endpoints, and those two things have to be done separately. And so it's also nice to have an interval of convergence. What is the interval of convergence? Well, it's exactly this, right? Okay, this is the in IOC interval of convergence. And that's exactly this thing. For what explicit values of x does the power series converge, right? Okay, so if I have um, what is my interval of convergence? What is the set of all possible values? Um, if I'm in this first case, it's all possible values of x. Where it's got convergence, there's only one. A set with only one element, right? It's just when x is the number a, right? That's the interval of convergence. Not really an interval, it's just a point. It's a point of convergence. Converges at one point only. What is the interval of convergence if my... Um, radius of convergence is infinite. Well, then it's all real numbers, right? Convergence for all real numbers, right? Because you can go infinitely away, yeah? And what's the interval of convergence if I have some finite real number, right? That's what capital R is, some positive finite real number, right? Okay, it's not zero, it's not infinite, some number in between, yeah? Um, then what is my interval of convergence? Well, I don't know, right? Okay. There's four possibilities. Depending on each endpoint. It could either be the whole interval with both endpoints included, it could be the interval with both end both endpoints excluded, or you could include one endpoint and not the other, or this endpoint and not that one. So there's four possibilities, right? And now we're gonna launch into um, some problems that will demonstrate uh, a variety of these things. Does this make sense? And then we'll get some feeling for why these are only the only possibilities, okay? All right, so interval convergence is just like asking about domain. And we're just asking, when is the output of that series? For what x values will we get something finite? Yeah? Okay, are you ready? Let's see if there's anything else I need to mention before we go on. Um, all right, so let's do an example. zero to infinity x to the n over n factorial. Who remembers this guy? Yeah, 1.6, number 45, right? We spent some time with that guy. Um, we're going to spend some more time next week with him as well. All right, so what did we do, right? We asked about this, where does this guy converge or diverge? So we've already sort of done this problem, right? Okay, for 1x, so we're all, we already have done 
some power series problems, just not knowing to call them power series. For, for what x does this power series, now we'll just explicitly say it, right, converge? Maybe you remember the result. If we write it in this notation, right, then we would see that it's the sum n equals 0 to infinity. What is the c sub n here? You tell me, what's the c sub n? Good. 1 over n factorial, right, times what? x to the n, what is a? a is 0, right? So this guy, c sub n, is 1 over n factorial. And because it's just x minus 0 to the n, the simplest case of a power series, a is 0. So this is a power series centered at 0, OK? Power series centered at 0. All right, so what did we do, right, for this guy, OK? Well, we really think of him like this, right? This was our a sub n. And um, here we're just kind of splitting up for you to see it's really a constant at each end times a power function, right? Um, an individual power function for, for each specific value of n, right? There's a lot of confusing things going on here. Okay, so what did we do? We did the ratio test. We'll do it again real quick because this is going to be ratio tests and root tests are your go-tos, right? Okay, so this is really 11.6 on steroids, yeah? With 11.5 thrown in, yeah? It's awesome. All right, so um, continuing to do this work is not going to harm you as you prepare for your quiz on 11.5 and 11.6. Um, all right, what does the ratio test say? It says look at the limit, right, as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 divided by a n. We've already done this, right? But here we'll do it one more time just because of how important this particular series is. So what do we get? We're going to do it faster though now because we're good at this. Um, now first of all, right, absolute value, the ratio test for absolute convergence, right, that's always meant whenever, you know, if you don't say it, you still mean it. It's clear when you write the absolute values, yeah? Um, so let's look at this thing. What do we have? We're going to have the absolute value of what is a sub n plus 1? x to the n plus 1, right, divided by n plus 1 factorial. I'll write it like this just one time and never again. Um, divide by a to the n, so that's x to the n. This is all in absolute values, right, divided by n factorial, right? We're super good at this now. So we end up almost going straight to this step now. The limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value of instead of fraction over fraction, we know that the a sub n plus 1 guy is going to be here, right? And then dividing by a n means we flip that guy, and then the a n is going to get written like this, right? So we almost go pretty much straight from here to here now, okay? Where we didn't before when we were just learning it. All right, so now what do we do? We've got the limit as n goes to infinity. Of, we simplify that guy, so how does that simplify? I've got my absolute values out here. I um, write it in such a way that it's absolutely clear what is being canceled, right? I'll be looking for this in your work on the final. Um, so I've got x to the n times x times n factorial, right? That's what I have in the numerator. And in the denominator, what do I have? I want to rewrite my n plus 1 factorial how? n plus 1 times n factorial times my other guy x to the n, yeah? Now it's very clear what I can cancel and what I am canceling and that I understand what I'm canceling, right? So what are we canceling? We've got an x to the n on the top and an x to the n on the bottom. We've got an n factorial on top and an n factorial on the bottom, right? And what does that give us then? With This is the limit as n goes to infinity of... Okay, so um, I'm going to, again, just belabor this piece just a little bit more to make sure we all start understanding all the subtleties here. So what do I have? The absolute value of x over n plus 1, right? Okay. Now, what can you tell me about n plus 1? Is it positive or negative? Good. It's positive, right? Ns are, z start at 0 and go to infinity. So I don't need an absolute value around n plus 1 down here, right? Because that's always positive. Absolute value positive thing's the same. 
do I need absolute value around the x? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. For what x does this power series converge? x is a real number. Real numbers are both positive and negative, right? So we're trying to decide what subset of the real numbers um, does this guy converge? So x can always be negative, and so you have to have the absolute value there, right? Does that make sense? Okay. It doesn't matter so much right here, but it's going to matter. Okay. So um, I'd still be looking for it. So here we have this. Now what else do you know, right? What is moving? N is moving, right? N is moving. There's no limit of X in here, right? So you might make sure you write your limits correctly. X is fixed as far as N is concerned. X could be any fixed real number, right? And therefore, I'm going to take a limit as N goes to infinity of something that's not changing divided by something that's getting huge. So constant divided by something blowing up, what is that limit? Good. That limit is zero. Very nice. Now, what were we doing? Oh yeah, it was the ratio test. I wrote it down. That reminds me that I'm doing it. What's the conclusion of the ratio test? What am I looking for after it computes this limit? Oh yeah, I want this to be less than one, right? This is my L. It's zero. I want it to be less than one. For what x is zero less than one? For every x. Zero is always less than one, right? So this result doesn't put any restriction on x for this limit to be less than 1. Yeah? And therefore, since this is always true for all x, 0 less than 1, right? What does that say? Therefore, what does that say? Um, this series converges for all x, okay, what does that mean in our new terminology? So the radius of convergence is, good, infinite, and the interval of convergence is, the set minus infinity to infinity. Any x in here works, right? Yes? So this was an example from the second of the three possibilities, right, that we had, that we have uh, infinite rate of convergence in an interval of minus infinity to infinity. Does that make sense? Are we all good here? Ready to do another example? This was a previous example, right? So again, what is this guy? If I think about the interval of convergence, this is a power series centered about zero, right? How far can I go away from zero? Infinitely far in either direction, and it still converges. Make sense? Okay? Okay? Awesome. Okay, let's do another example. You ready? similar to a homework problem, right? Um, 11.8 number 8, this one is, okay? So I've got sum n equals 1 to infinity of n to the n times x to the n. Maybe you already have an instinct of what's going to happen here, so let's play it out. What do we have here? This guy is my c sub n right? n to the n, yeah? This is my powers of x, so what is a? Zero again, right? Okay. So again, maybe what you're seeing is, right, the change in the constants, the coefficients, are going to change what's going to happen with the power series convergence, right? And divergence. Different coefficients, different convergence. All right, so let's see what this guy says. Um, so let's try the exact same thing we just did, right? The ratio test, okay? Um, well, actually, you know what? We, it's gonna be so much
much simpler. In fact, when you're, we've done a lot of ratio tests um, in a variety of our most recent examples in 11.6, right? Um, we've done a few root test examples. A lot of times the root test is way simpler. And so let's just go with root test here, okay? And um, because of very similar, very similar ideas, very similar but simpler proofs, right? You should have already been figuring that out for root test. Um, and so we have the same kind of concepts going on here. So let's look at this, right? So we still have this. And our question is, right, here's zero. All these series converge when x is zero. So does it converge anywhere beyond zero, right? That's our question. And if so, how far away? Infinitely far or not? So what does the root test say? Remember the root test says look at the limit, right? It's still a series. You're going to test this series for convergence. The difference is, is that x can be any real number, right? And the question is, what real numbers will make this series converge, right? Okay. So what does the root test say? It's the limit of n goes to infinity of the doesn't matter how you want to write it, the nth root of the absolute value of a n, right? Which is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n to the 1 over n, right? The nice thing about the root test is I don't have to create a ratio, I don't have to do a sub n plus 1, but I do have to do an nth root, so I have to know what I'm doing there, right? So let's see how this guy plays out. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of what is the a n, the whole thing, right? Okay, that's the whole thing. So what do I have? Absolute value of n to the n times x to the n all to the one over n power. Yeah? Okay, well, let's see here. Uh, there's a couple of things that we need to think about when we do these problems. So first, let's notice the limit as n goes to infinity of um, n to the n, n is positive, right? n starts at 1, right? When n's going off to infinity, n to the n. So this guy is positive, right? So that guy doesn't need to be in absolute values, okay? That guy can be in out of the absolute values. But x could be positive or negative, and so we have the absolute value of x to the n, right? So all I did right here is say what is legit with the absolute value, right? And I still have a 1 over n out here, yeah? So it, the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values, but that guy is positive, and therefore its absolute value is just it, right? But what else? I'm still not doing any um, nth roots yet. I'm still not taking any limits. I'm just doing algebra. Um, the absolute value of something to a power is the same as the absolute value of that thing to the power, right? And so I always want to get this guy as the absolute value of x and without the power there, that'll make my life just simpler. Do you see why it's simpler? Okay. Um, okay, so now you're kind of seeing what's going on. Now it's rules of exponents. That was just the idea of making sure you pay attention to what can be positive, what is always positive, and what could be negative. All right, so now what? Well, let me just come down here. Now what do we have? Now we got to do rules of exponents. It's just algebra of exponents. So what do I have? I've got two different pieces here multiplied together, right? What do I have to do? I've got to apply that to each piece, right? Yeah? Okay? And so I'm just going to write it to make sure we see it again. So it's n to the n to the 1 over n times the absolute value of x to the n to the 1 over n, right? That's rules of exponents, yeah? And again, you're going to get faster with this. But let's just make sure we all get it. So what is n to the n to the 1 over n? 1, right? So that's just n, yeah? Right? Rules of exponents. n times 1 over n. So what about this one? Good. Times the absolute value of x, right? n to the 1 over n. These guys multiply, we have 1, right? So now this limit ends up being the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the absolute value of x. What's moving? What's fixed? n is moving. x is fixed, right? 
This is a constant times n. Where does a constant times n go as n grows unbounded? And positive, goes off to infinity, right? This is a positive constant, right? So it goes off to positive infinity. Yes, does that make sense? Why were we doing this problem? <gasps> root test. Root test for what? For absolute convergence, right? Yay. What is the result from root test? Root test says we do this limit, we come out with the limit, and what do we look for? <gasps> bigger or less than one, right? It's bigger than one, right? What happens if we're in the case where you have something bigger than one coming out of that limit? Diverges by the root test, okay? This guy diverges by the root test. So that's, what do we then say? Okay, well this diverges for all x except at x equals zero, right? So therefore, for this guy, and notice, just to make sure you're aware, right? If x were zero, this isn't a zero times infinity indeterminate form. If x is identically zero, it's not approaching zero, it's zero times a thing before you take the limit. And zero times a thing is zero, right? Does that make sense? Okay, anyway. Um, so this diverges um, for all x um, real, okay, uh, except x equals zero, when x is zero, we just have um, a single zero, right? So we have convergence at zero, and then we have divergence everywhere else. That's it, okay? Converge, diverge, <laughs> everywhere else, yeah? What do we call that? So what do we say? This guy has a radius of convergence of zero. What zero is that? Is that this zero? No. That zero is how far away I can go from zero. Nowhere, right? Yeah, good. And what is the interval of convergence? Good. A set containing only zero. What zero is that? That's that zero, right? Yeah, the set containing only this number is where I have convergence. Yeah? All righty. Ready to do another one? That's more, even more fun. We good? Maybe you expected this guy was not gonna converge for any x except zero. That would have been a good instinct. And do the n, x to the n. Yeah. All right. You ready for another slightly longer example? This is gonna be fun. So that one we just did, number eight, is the first case of the three possibilities, right? Where you only have a single point where you have convergence. Now let's do another one, okay? 11.8, number 18, okay? Um, we have the sum, n equals one to infinity, of the square root of n divided by eight to the n, times x plus six to the n, okay? Okay, so this is a power series, right? What is cn? These guys. The square root of n over eight to the n is cn, right? Where is this power series centered around? Careful. Good. A is negative six, right? Remember, it's sum n equals zero to infinity of cn, or one, it doesn't really matter where it starts, right? If we're talking about convergence, only tail is all that matters, x minus a to the n, right? So what is a negative six for us, yeah? Okay, so this is a power series. The question is, for what x does this converge with reverse, right? So, saying for what x does this converge with reverse is the same as saying, find the interval of convergence. Yeah? Okay. 
Remember, the radius of convergence tells us how far away we can go, but it doesn't tell us what happens at those endpoints. We'll see why here. Maybe you've already guessed why. What should we do? Well, what are our options? We got ratio test or root test, right? Okay. Which one's going to be better? Simpler. Faster. Stronger. Easier. As long as you understand your roots, right? If you understand your roots, root test is going to be easier. Let's do root test again. Okay? Ready? What does root test say we're going to do? Okay, now again, what are we doing? This whole thing is what we need to be testing, right? That's the an, okay? Sum of an. It's just now that our ans have x's in them, right? If you're thinking about the root test. Um, so we're doing the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n to the 1 over n, right? And we're going to see what we get out of that limit. Okay, so what do we got? The nice thing is that we just get to plot that guy in, right? We don't have to do any n plus ones like we do with ratio tests. We don't have any fractions um, that aren't already there, right? So we have that times x plus 6 to the n, and we're going to do the whole thing to the 1 over n, right? All I did was put that guy in there. Now tell me, what of this is always positive? This guy is. Square root of n over a to the n is always positive, right? n is always positive here. Okay, so as I'm trying to break down what I really need to do for this limit, right, that piece is going to be just the square root of n over 8 to the n, right? Doesn't need to stay in absolute values. So the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. That piece is already. And then if I'm doing the absolute value of this piece, thing to the n, right? Instead of saying the absolute value of x plus 6 to the n, all that whole thing in absolute values, what should I write? Just to skip a step, right? The absolute value of x plus 6, right, raised to the n. Yeah? So I've got to have my absolute values, right? The absolute value of x plus 6 to the n is the same as the absolute value of x plus 6 raised to the n. Yeah? It helps me get there. And then I still have my 1 over n piece, yeah? All righty. So now what? Well, now i got to apply my roots, right? So you got to know your roots, right? So what do I have? This guy gets applied to both things, right? And this is a fraction, so it gets applied to the top and to the bottom, right? you got to know your rules of exponents. So what do I have? I've got the limit of the square root of n to the 1 over n divided by what is 8 to the n to the 1 over n? Just 8. Woohoo! Yay! Right? Okay. Times what is the absolute value of x plus 6 to the n to the 1 over n? to the 1 over n is 1. Yeah? So that leaves us just with a little aside here that we're going to do. What's the only limit that, what's the only thing that depends on n, right? 8 doesn't depend on n. Absolute value of x plus 6 doesn't depend on n, right? Yeah? It's just this guy, the square root of n to the 1 over n. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if I had already thought about what that limit might be. Maybe from a previous lecture, huh? Um, let's look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of n to the 1 over n. Yeah? Well, what is that? Okay? That limit is very similar to a limit. Recall what did we prove? We proved using L'Hopital's rule and rules of ex the lot na taking natural log and rules of exponents um, when we had exponent indeterminate forms, we proved that the limit as n goes to infinity of what? 
good n to the 1 over n, the nth root of n, as n goes to infinity is 1. Good. All right? That I said was going to be important, right? That's almost what we have here, but not quite, right? Because what does square root of n mean? That's the limit as n goes to infinity, right, of n to the 1 half to the 1 over n. Yeah? Square root of n. Yeah? Now, what do we want to do with this limit? Very similar to when I said, think about n to the p to the 1 over n, right? Yeah? What can I do with these two guys, right? Algebraically, I can swap them. It's the same thing, right? x to the a to the b is the same as x to the b to the a, because it's all x to the a times b, which is the same as x to the b times a, right? So here we go. This is n to the 1 over n to the 1 half. We're getting close. I'm making the limit of this thing to the 1 half, right? This is the limit of the square root of that guy. But what do I know I can do with my limit? It can come inside a power, right? Because the square root's po uh, continuous for positive uh, arguments. And so what do we know? That this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the 1 over n bring the limit inside, right, bring the limit inside, and then do the one-half power, and what do we know this limit is? Woohoo! Right? We know this limit is 1, so what is 1 to the one-half? The square root of 1, which is also 1, right? This limit is 1. You think it would be different if this was some other power p? This is awesome, okay? So, as long as we know these limits, what is this guy going to? Going to 1 as n goes to infinity. And therefore, what is this limit equal to? 1 8 times the absolute value of x plus 6. Now, that's only part of the battle, right? We've evaluated the limit from root test. If you would have done ratio tests correctly, you would have done had different calculations along the way, but ended up with this exact same evaluation of the limit. Okay? The question is, what do we do now? Right? What do we do once we evaluate the limit? And it's not like the other two problems that we just did, where one time the limit was zero, which was always less than one, and the other time the limit uh, grew unbounded, went off to infinity, which is always greater than 1, right? So now we have to utilize what we know. What does the root test tell us? The root test tells us that provided this result, right, is less than 1, so now we're going to force this inequal this expression to be smaller than 1 um, for absolute convergence. Right? That's the restriction from case one of the root test. You have absolute convergence when the result of the limit is less than one. Well, what is this? It's an absolute value in quality, your favorite thing to work with, right? Okay. Right? You guys ready? Let's work with this absolute, absolute value in quality and see what it tells us. All right. So what do we need to do? We need to solve 1 8 times the absolute value of x plus 6 less than 1 um, for x. Okay? What is the best way to do this? If I'm going to solve this inequality, what is the first thing I ought to do? You guys tell me. Good. Multiply by 8. Good. So, that is equivalent to the absolute value of x plus 6 is less than 8. Yeah? Okay? Now, you know you've made some weird mistake if you get something negative that comes out of here, right? You should never get anything negative that came out. All right. So, and if you don't have the absolute values, you've totally blown it. Okay? So, they've got to be there. Because what does this mean? We've talked about it a thousand times, right? It's important, right? The distance between x and negative 6 is less than 8, right? If I don't, so there's lots of ways to think about it. You can think about it visually if you want at this stage. The distance between x and negative 6, since it's x minus minus 6, right? 
So if here is negative six, right, I can go eight units away and eight units away the other direction. Yeah? Now let's just see if we can solve it and see if we get what we would do over here. Okay? So what does this mean? If I want to um, get rid of the absolute values, what's my price I have to pay? Two inequalities, right? Minus eight less than x plus six less than eight. Yeah? And so even like if, um, and then what do we do from here? Then you just do whatever you need to do to solve for x, right? So in this case, we just subtract six from each side, right? Minus six, minus six, minus six, right? So what is negative eight minus six? Negative 14, which is less than x. Six cancel, eight minus six, two. Yeah, so that's what comes out of that guy, right? Visually, minus six plus eight is two. And minus six minus eight is negative 14. So what do I know, right? I know that I have convergence as long as I go at most eight away from negative six in both directions, right? And I know I have divergence out here because why? Because that's what the result of the root test would tell us, right? If this is bigger than one, then where am I? I'm out here and then I get divergence, right? So it's coming straight from the root test and ratio test results, right? Yeah, make sense? Is this my integral of convergence? Who knows? I can't say just yet because why? These endpoints, when x is 2 and when x is negative 14, I don't know what happens yet. What would they correspond to as far as the root test and ratio test are concerned? Yeah, this guy equaling one, the third case of the root test and rates. And what do we know about when the limit equals one from root test to ratio test? The test is inconclusive, it tells you nothing. You could have convergence, you could have divergence. And so these two values of x, these two special values, x equals two and negative 14 for this problem, are critical ones that have to be done separately. And that's what we're gonna go do right now, okay? Does that make sense? So we do know our radius of convergence, right? For this problem, our radius of convergence is eight. Good. We can go eight away from negative six, right? That's what we're getting from here, yeah? Okay, but we don't know our interval of convergence yet. We know it's at least negative 14 to two, but we don't know if it includes the endpoints or not. And if it does include which endpoint, it doesn't, it can include four, negative 14 and not two or vice versa. It can include neither or it can include both. That's what we're about to go do. Does that make sense? Now, another thing to just mention, um, sometimes you have, before we go do that, it's a little brief station break. Sometimes you might have a power series and it's not even written like this, right? A X minus A. You might have like eight X plus six. You might have some constant in here. That's not a big deal. If you think about all of this, right, how would that have worked? It just would have been right here, yeah? And then you would have subtracted six and then you would have had an eight there. And then you would have done what? Divide by eight, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so you gotta know how to work with absolute value inequalities, yeah? Okay, so it doesn't matter, right, if there's some constant multiplying this either, as long as you just keep true to the process, yeah? It's not as simple to read it right off um, is if we have x minus a number. If there's a um, constant multiplying x, yeah? All right, you guys ready to go figure out whether x equal negative 14 and x equal two are in the interval of convergence, okay? Uh, here we go. What about x equals negative 14 and x equals 2? That's what we've got left to do. Okay. 
know the radius of convergence, we don't know the interval of convergence. We want to find the interval of convergence that's the domain of our series, right? What x's give us something um, useful, <laughs> something finite. All right, so then you just got to do these uh, piece by piece, okay? So um, let's look at x equal 2 first, okay? So check the endpoints. First, we'll do x equals 2. It doesn't matter which one we do first, okay? It doesn't matter. Let's do x equals 2. So if x is 2, right, then what am I going to do? I'm saying then our series, our original series, becomes what? Well, here's our original series. I put a 2 in for x, right? So what does it become? The sum n equals 1 to infinity of the square root of n over 8 to the n times what? 2 plus 6 is, good, 8 to the n. Yeah? Okay. Those guys cancel. What am I left with? The sum n equals 1 to infinity of the square root of n. Yeah? Alrighty. That's what we have. Well, tell me about this series. Does it converge or diverge? Obvious. This diverges by what? The divergence test, right? What do you do? We take the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of n. Where does that go? Infinity. What do we care? It's not zero. If the limit of the nth term is not zero, the divergence test says diverges. So what did we just discover? What did we do? x equals 2. 2 is not out in. Okay? So 2 is not in. Okay, all right, what about x equals 14? Will we have a different result? Negative 14. <laughs> x equals 14, we know it would diverge, right? Okay, x equals negative 14, we don't know. x equals negative 15, we know it diverges, right? Okay, um, so x equals negative 14, what does our series become? We have the sum, n equals 1 to infinity, square root of n over 8 to the n. Now I'm going to put in a negative 14 for x. Negative 14 plus 6 is negative 8 to the n. Yeah? Okay. So now what? Let's just make sure we understand this terminology. Remember, negative 8 to the n is the same as negative 1 times 8 to the n which is the same as negative 1 to the n times 8 to the n, right? Yeah? So, this is the same as the square root of n over 8 to the n times negative 1 to the n times 8 to the n. Don't miss that piece. For this problem, it's not going to matter so much, but for another example we may do next video, um, and for many other examples, there's lots of examples in your book as well. You got to make sure you read those. Um, we're actually going to do one of those maybe in the next lecture where we do it a little more carefully than what's in there. Um, kind of things I'll be looking for when you're showing me your work. But anyway, as it is right here, um, we have these guys canceling, but we're left with this. So now what do we have? We've got an alternating series, right? And it really doesn't matter. We have now an alternating series, minus 1 to the n times the square root of n, right? This is an alternating series. Should I use the alternating series test? No, why not? I already know from what we did up here, right? This guy is going to infinity. This guy is just going to make it bounce back and forth between positive and negative, right? And so if this guy is going to infinity in absolute value, multiplying it by negative 1 or positive 1 is just going to make it bounce back and forth between uh, positive negative numbers that just grow unbounded, right? And so what do we know? Again, the divergence test, right, um, says diverge because the limit as n goes to infinity of minus 1 to the n times the square root of n 
is not zero because we just looked at this guy up here, right? This guy does not exist. Bounces back and forth between plus and minus infinity. Yeah, does that make sense? And so this series when x is negative 14 also diverges. And so what do we know? Negative 14 is also not allowed in. So what is the interval of convergence? Okay, now we can say with certainty that the interval of convergence is open parentheses negative 14 to 2, right? So that's the same as saying x is strictly less than 2, strictly greater than negative 14. We're not including the endpoints, right? Open parentheses, not brackets. But it would have been completely wrong to conclude that without checking each endpoint separately, right? Because it could have been a different result. And in the next example we do, um, which I think I'll do in one other short video, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah, just do that in one other short video a little bit later. Um, we will have a, we'll see a different result where, um, where we might have convergence at one of the endpoints, but not at the other, okay? So this is only one of the possible cases. It could have been if both guys, uh, that both endpoints were included. There are some problems when both endpoints end up being a series that does um, converge. And there are some problems where only one of the two endpoints end up being a series, uh, and it could be either one where the series converges, okay? In fact, think about what if these two series, instead of having the square root of n in the numerator, had had the square root of n in the denominator. I think that's a pretty good place to leave this video. So you think about that. What if this one had turned out to be one over the square root of n? Would that series have converged or diverged? And why? That's the critical piece. And what if this one was alternating with a one over square root of n? Would that series have converged or diverged? And why? Right? Well, we may address that in the very next video. Have a nice weekend. See you soon.